Bob Wells, loser. And that's how, exactly how I felt. And then a very weird thing happened. After a few months, for the first time in my life, I started to feel like I belonged. I had, a, I had meaning and I had purpose. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your very kind welcome. I really appreciate that. And I've shaken hands with a whole bunch of you. And I'm always grateful when anyone comes up and says, hi, says, what you do has made a difference in my life. I'm very grateful to that. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. When I say I want to live tiny, whether that is a Prius, a bicycle, or one of the nicest 600 square feet tiny homes you've ever seen, my decision to live tiny makes sense. And I can explain to you in good logical reasons why I am and why I think you should consider it, at least. And so that's what I want to talk about today. It's the why, the philosophy of tiny living. So let's first define what does tiny living mean. Now, uh, if, I, if we went around and polled different people, we'd get all kinds of different answers. Here is my definition. Living in a tiny home is an attitude. It's a cry of your heart. It's a predisposition of your heart to something smaller, uh, simpler, more natural than what most people are living in. I believe that living tiny is a normal, natural, healthy response to a world of more, bigger, better, I got to have more. Before World War II, the average size of a home was about 1,000 square feet. Now it's up, it was up at 2,000 and, and it grows every decade. It's three, I think it's like three or 4,000 now, the average size of an American home. It's, it's really amazing. They're just bigger and bigger and bigger. People are wanting bigger and more, and the only reason they are limited to that small size, 3,000 square feet, is because that's all they can afford. No, it's all the credit they have. If they had more credit, it would be 4,000 or 5,000. Credit holds us down to a reasonable 3,000 square foot home for one or two people. There is a natural, uh, normal way that humans should live. I think there's an objective standard. Now, I've, all, I've introduced this by saying we're all different and there is no objective standard. And so if I say something too firmly, you can say that doesn't apply to me. I want, I'm welcome to that. But I believe there is an objective standard of how humans should live, and that is tiny. In 1995, I was just, uh, I was married, had two kids, living the American dream, which for me was a nightmare, and I went through a divorce. Through the, at the end of the divorce, uh, my wife had stayed home with our kids to homeschool. She had not worked, so it's hard. I, was, I worked all my life in a grocery store at a union store. I was a union clerk. I made a good wage, I had a good uh, retirement, I had good health care, but I was at the kind of in the bottom middle of the socioeconomic, and without my ex-wife working, we were at the very bottom of the medium, the uh, middle class. So when the divorce happened, I couldn't afford to live. I could not afford to pay for that household and create a new household for me to move in. I'd been a backpacker and a hiker all my life, I could live out of a backpack, and I drove home, I uh, went to work every day and drove home, and every day I drove past a van, an old beat up box van. And I've lived out of a backpack for months. I can live out of a van. So one day I stopped, uh, and I bought the van, and that day I bought it, it was $1,500. And this was 1995, so money was worth more then, but $1,500 is a really cheap van. It had a good solid engine, but it was ugly. I moved in and slept in it that night. Now, so I'm going through the divorce, we're fighting about the kids, we're fighting about everything, name it, we're fighting about it, but particularly the kids, which is the only thing that really counts. And I was miserable beyond words. Some of you have gone through divorce, I won't show, have, do a show of hands. And so you understand how devastating divorce can be, should be, to your, to your heart and your mind and your life. And my first night living, sleeping in this van, I just parked on the corner. I just, I was, I, I was just bought the van, Threw down, I brought a sleeping pad and a sleeping bag, and that was my first night of van life, and it was not glamorous. And I cried myself to sleep that night, and I thought to myself, what a loser I am at life. I am everything that society says I should not be. I'm homeless, I'm living in my vehicle on the street corner, and I have no 
future of being anywhere but homeless, living in this van on the street corner. And I kept working on the same job. Every morning I went to work, and I had a, it was a good job. I got paid well for the time, but because there was only one income, I lived in Anchorage, Alaska. So when it got down to 30 below, I really knew I was a hopeless loser. Bob Wells, loser. And that's how, exactly how I felt. And then a very weird thing happened. After a few months, I tore out all the shelving, I built a bed, I brought in my recliner. Bringing in the recliner in a box van is really, really a joy. Then my heart started to feel a whole lot better when the recliner was in there. And so uh, the kids came and spent the weekends with me. I built bunk beds. Uh, I bought a, a big 32-inch big tube. You know, back in 1995, there were no flat screens. So it was this, two, this huge 32-inch TV because they had to play PlayStation. But a very weird, weird thing happened. For the first time in my life, I started to feel like I belonged. I had, a, I had meaning and I had purpose. And I felt joy. And within a year, because I knew how to backpack, I, I could certainly make this 8x12 box van very comfortable and homey. And I did. And within the year, I loved it. And for the very first time in my life, I felt good inside. My heart was happy. And so I set out on a journey from that day in 1995 to this of understanding why most people, and I, 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 could, talk long, I could talk a long time about why uh, Thoreau's famous quote, most people live lives of quiet desperation. And I believe that's absolutely true of nearly everyone in this country today. The vast majority of people are living lives of their enduring their lives with quiet desperation. And here I'd found something that really made me happy, and I told my friends about it, none of them ever did it, but I told them about it. Uh, uh, Ten years later, in 2005, I started my website, Cheap RV Living. I loved it so much, and I felt so bad for all these people who were just living their lives of quiet desperation, hating their lives, just like I did, and they didn't know there was anything better. They didn't know how to do it. They didn't know how to fix, solve all the problems. How do I cook? How do I go to the bathroom? How do I stay clean? So I started CheapRVLiving.com, and then in, in 2005, I, tarted, I, did, I devoted myself to telling people and showing them how they could do it. And in 2008, the economy collapsed, 2009. And so I got inundated. My website exploded. I saw the enormous need. I got tens of thousands of emails from people. I've lost my job. I'm going to live in my car. I'm hopeless. I'm desperate. What can I do? That's when my life as it is now was born because... I wanted to communicate to as many people as I can. They had a choice. They had an alternative. Let me give you a simple summary sentence of what I believe is the normal objective standard of human living, and it's tiny, and why we are all here, because that resides in our heart. Here's, here's, here it is in a nutshell. So we have, as humans and pre-humans, have been on this planet for a little over 2 million years. And in that entire time, we have lived as uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers because and bands of approximately 50 to 100 people. That's, a ver that's the 100 is about the upper limit of all the people you could know intimately and well, and 50 is about the lower limit of what can be successful and, and thrive in living in nature. So our little band of 50 to 100 would come in, We'd have find this great place. There was water. There was there was firewood. There was a lot of game. There were a lot of nuts and berries and and tubers and life was really good. Then we would eat that all up. We'd poop. We'd all go poop and we'd all burn all the firewood and we'd all poop the water and then we moved on. And that nature heals that real quickly and easily. So that meal by the time we would come back, which would be a year or two later, that would all heal. Because and we had very low impact on the on the planet. Season would change, the game would change, the the plants that grew would change. We would move on. We'd move on every month. We'd move on every six months. That moving required us to own very 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 few things. Uh, you can't own many things if you're going to move every month. If you can't, if you're going to move every four months, every six months, every year, you just can't own much because you've got to carry it in your hands. Remember, this is all pre-horse. 
before we domesticated horses. Horses were very recently domesticated. Things were the enemy. The more things you had, the harder it was to move. You've got to carry it in your hands when you move. You'd have a knapsack, you'd have something on your back, but not much. So things were the enemy. Humans grew up, things were the enemy, not a blessing. They were a curse, because you've got to carry them. When you got to the new place, you could make everything you needed in half a day. So why carry it? I'll get there, there'll be plenty of materials, I'll make it new. And that's just what they did. They disposed of it, left, made new. And so humans move. They move with the seasons, they move with the game, they move with the plants, uh, plants and animals. And that's what we've always done. And we've always lived profoundly, deeply connected to nature. And we've lived in a spiritual relationship with nature. So that is what all humans lived like until 10,000 years ago. So in the last 10,000 years, with the agricultural revolution, we abandoned nomadic living, and all of these things I've just described, threw them all out, said that's all garbage, we're going to live completely differently now, threw it all out, and today we're reaping the reward of that in people who are profoundly miserable. We're moving beyond quiet desperation and into let's kill each other and let's hate each other. Let's find a reason to hate each other. In anthropology, there's a, uh, a, there are branches of anthropology and psychology called evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology. And they study the human body to see how it has evolved over time and they study psychology and the human brain, neurolog they're neurologists, about how it has changed over time. And they have a phrase, and it's called the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. And it's very simple, it's, it's really obvious, the truth of this statement. It's that every creature evolved to live in an environment. And as long as it's in that environment, it's happy. So. While we're here on planet Earth, we're all going to be really happy. If we're transported to the moon, the, that environment is so radically different, we're all going to die. So we are, should be living in bands of 50 to 100 in profound connection to each other. The way we raise our kids, the way we live our lives, it's all wrong. It's all completely different, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, and therefore we have this, lead these lives of quiet desperation, and in our heart is a tug for tiny living. Because tiny living is as close as we can get today, right now, to living nomadic lives. Tiny lives. Very few things, moving often, deeply connected to each other, deeply connected to nature. Tiny living is normal and natural, and you're here as living proof of that. There's a tug in your heart for tiny living. There's a dissatisfaction in your life with the life as you have lived it, your lives of quiet desperation, and you want to change. So the bottom line is, in our hearts, is a hunger for a non-bizarre way of life which is what Western society is today. My YouTube channel is devoted how you can get that with almost no money. How you can buy your own, there's a really beautiful uh, cargo trailer conversion. You can buy your own cargo trailer, you can buy an eight by 10 cargo trailer and convert it into a really nice home. You can do it, I promise. You can do it, you can do it all. You don't need to pay someone. This is available and accessible to you. I have talked to, in the last 20 years, I have talked to thousands and thousands of people who have heard what I said and did what I recommended, and with almost no exceptions, they've said, I'm happier than I've ever been. So I hope you got something out of the video today. If you did, like us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, hit that thumbs up button, and we'll talk to you later. Bye now.